Hi, this is Matt, the Game Explainer. Today I'm going to be looking at Mule the Board Game, designed by Heike Harju and published by Lautapelit.fi. Uh, it is a game for three to four players and takes roughly two hours, uh, plus or minus a little bit, to play. All right, so what is Mule? Well, Mule the Board Game um, was actually um, a redevelopment of Mule the Computer Game, which came out for the Atari 800 and Commodore 64 back in 1983. That's right, 1983. <laughs> so it's been 32 years since the original computer game came out. And uh, when the computer game came out, it was considered um, you know, very revolutionary for its time because it was um, basically a strategy board game, but on a personal computer. Um, and it was intended or designed to have multiple you know, people, multiple players, all gather around the computer and play this strategy board game together, but on a computer. Um, so again, it was, you know, kind of very novel for its time. It was very advanced for its time. Um, it included a number of, you know, mechanisms that you see in modern board games, like, you know, catch up mechanisms and, you know, a, uh, a market-based economy and things like that. So anyway, it's a, it's a really cool game. Um, and I was a huge fan of the computer game. Um, when it came out, I was a teenager and I played, played the heck out of the computer game. Really, really enjoyed it. And so I'm very, very excited to uh, have the board game version and uh, to be doing this video today. So um, anyway, let me go ahead and explain what you see in front of you. Um, I have the table set up for a three player game. Um, you've got the main board, which is this long, narrow board here in the middle. Um, it depicts the uh, planet Irata over here with a bunch of land tiles on it. Um, and the basic idea in the game is, you know, players are different um, you know, races, if you will that uh, have landed on this new planet to colonize it. And so the, um, the different players or races are competing to be the most you know, effective at colonizing the planet. Um, and so um, you're going to play either six or seven rounds in the game. And um, depending on if you play the beginner game, which is six rounds, or the tournament game, which is seven rounds. And then um, in each round of the game, basically the flow is players are going to get a land grant. So each player will get a, another free t uh, land tile from the planet. It's basically you're just claiming land. And then um, once you have your land, you can then uh, go to the store here um, and buy what are called mules. And mule stands for multiple use labor element. Uh, it's basically these little guys here that are um, kind of robotic machines that you can you know purchase at the store and take out to your land and then outfit those mules to produce different um, goods or commodities, if you will, in the game. And of course, you know there's a market um, which is depicted here in the center of the main board. And there's four different types of goods. There's the blue, which is smith ore. Smith ore is needed by the colony in order to make more mules. So um, as long as there's smith ore available in the store, as players buy mules, uh, the store will automatically convert the smith ore into more mules. Um, <clears throat> then there's Christite, which is the purple um, commodity. Uh, Christite is not needed by the colony. It's just a luxury item, if you will, like gold or diamonds that can be found um, you know, underneath uh, the planet surface. And so it's something that players can um, uh, speculate for. They can, you know, look to see if there's a Christite available on their lands, and then they can, you know, mine the Christite and ship it off planet for sometimes a very nice profit. Um, but because Christite is not needed by the colony on the planet, it's only, you know, consumed off planet. The um, kind of demand and the price structure for Christite is um, uh, unpredictable. So it's going to change randomly from round to round or turn to turn in the game. And so, um, you know, doing the Christite strategy in this game is a, um, more of a, you know, push your luck, high risk kind of uh, strategy because sometimes you'll find a lot of Christite and, and maybe you can make a lot of money off it and other times you're not going to make as much money. So, you know, it's one of those things you have to kind of uh, weigh against going with the more predictable goods, uh, which are, you know, the Smith ore. And then the other two are food, which is green, and energy, which is orange. So Smith ore, food, and energy, um, their prices will uh, fluctuate up and down based more on kind of supply and demand, right? So there's a certain demand within the colony and, and by the players uh, for Smith ore, food, and energy. 
Um, and then, of course, players will determine the supply based on how much of those three items they produce. And I'll explain, you know, what actually drives the prices up and down um, a little bit later when I get into the market phase here. But just suffice it to say that, again, Smithor food and energy are the more kind of uh, predictable in terms of their, you know, the way the prices are going to go up and down. Christite can be a very high profit um, item, but it can also be very unpredictable. So there's that kind of two different you know, opposing strategies there that players can go after or, you know, kind of blend however they see fit. Now, <clears throat> um, over here on the right is um, a, a ranking chart where the players uh, will be ranked at the end of every round. And um, that will drive kind of the player order for certain um, phases of the game turn. And, um, and you know, and basically you want to be the top ranked you know player at the end of the game because because it's an economic game the game is all about making money so by the end of the game you want to have the most money that's how you win the game uh in between you know you can you know buy and sell different goods and you know do other actions uh however you see fit hopefully trying to you know maximize your production capability and maximizing your profits now, each player has a player mat that is depicted here, okay? So I've just got three of them uh, placed out. Uh, the game does come with four player mats that are double-sided to show uh, the different races in the game, okay? So like this one's got humanoid and legite as two different, you know, options here. And then there's um, two more on each of these, so there's eight different races in the game that players can, can play. Um, also on each, uh, each you know, uh, race or on each mat, there's a special ability that's shown here that is optional. Um, you know, players can choose to use that or not, you know, um, as a whole at the start of the game if they want to have a little more variety and a little more specialization, you know, by the races. Otherwise, you can have a, you know, a um, uh, symmetric start with the players having all the same abilities if you don't, you know, if you don't use the special abilities. Um, okay, so uh, that is basically, like I said, the setup. Um, in terms of the, um, there's also, as you can see, like a big, you know, stockpile of resources up here. Um, there's the wooden bits for the different resources that can be, can be uh, sorry, can be produced. Smith ore, which have the mules on the flip side. And then, of course, Christite food and energy. They also provide some nice tall cylinders uh, like these, which um, are used to denote five of a particular good. You're going to need those in the last few rounds of the game as you're producing lots of stuff, hopefully. Uh, and uh, the, like I said, the rest of them are just uh, your standard, you know, uh, wooden discs that you see in a lot of, you know, uh, strategy games. Uh, there's money, uh, cardboard money tokens. They're very uh, nice and colorful and different shapes. Uh, ones, fives, tens, and fifties. So there's a whole bunch of those. Um, there's even a couple of purple two fifties up there for, again, uh, in the final accounting. Sometimes, you know, players will have a lot of money and you need to make change. And then you have a whole bunch of these uh, land tiles over on the planet surface. The planet is called Irata, which is Atari spelled backwards. It's kind of a joke because it came out, you know, the computer game came out for the Atari 800 first. Uh, hopefully you can see these land tiles um, if it's going to focus for me. And each land can produce, you know, th um, some or all of the different goods in the game. Like these are foothills. They can produce, you know, pretty much anything, but not you know, in great quantities. So the number of symbols represents how well that land can produce that, that uh, different, you know, good. So this is Smith or energy food. And then you'll notice the Christite side always has a purple question mark. Uh, the reason for that is, again, you don't know when you claim a plot of land, if there's going to be any Christite found on that plot of land. So the only way to find out if there's Christite is you can do what's called an assay action, and you can assay any the backside of any two tiles, and then you flip them over and find out, like in this case, there's a purple X. So uh, that means no Christite can be mined on this particular land tile. But if you assayed, for example, this mountain, you'd find, oh, hey, there's two Christite. So this mountain space is actually pretty good at producing Christite. And again, they're randomly, you know, seeded on the board at the start of the game. Uh, there is a pattern that you can follow if you want in terms of the distribution of mountains, foothills, and um, plains tiles. Uh, the plains look like this. They just kind of a blank center. Um, <clears throat> or you can simply, they give you extra tiles, so you can simply just mix all the tiles and do a completely random distribution if you want on the board, which can be nice, you know, for experienced players 
to have a different mix and variety of terrain types uh, to choose from. The other thing you'll notice um, on the board, the main board as well as the player boards, is there are three colored zones for the land tiles. Red, white, and the white is, you know, surrounding the store, which again, the store is blown up here, right? But on your, your land map, it's in the center of your map. And then the blue zone. Uh, what that really, all, all, what the zones are really for is um, if you take a tile from the red zone of the main board, you have to put it on your red zone. You know, blue goes to blue and white to white. Um, the main reason for that, as you'll see, is um, when you're spending food to take actions in the game, if you're trying to manage your lands that are further away from the store, so the red and the blue zones, they take more food because they take more time, right? So it's kind of, you know, equating um, what you had to do in the computer game in terms of, you know, needing to spend more time to manage lands that are further away from the store. So so that all makes sense. Um <clears throat> So let's see, what else uh, do you see here? There's a few decks of cards. We'll talk about what those cards do in, a, in just a little bit. Um, each player also gets one of these nice handy dandy, um, you know, uh, turn summaries and reference charts here so they can remember what actions to take and how much food they cost. So I'll run down through that. Um, each player also can start with uh, one or two cards. Um, there is a land for sale card, um, which allows players to trigger an auction for a plot of land from the planet. Um, so that would be in addition to the free plot of land that you get every turn. Um, and it's just, again, a way to get more land out into the player's control more quickly. Um, and each player has one of these cards. Now, if you're playing the beginner game, then there are no land auctions. So players would not have any land for sale cards. It's only for the tournament game. Players also uh, start with this package from the home world card, which is basically a way for... Um, a player who maybe, you know, uh, made a mistake or, um, you know, is somehow short on food or energy coming into the beginning of a, of a game round or a game turn. It's a way for them to get a little extra food or energy um, so that they don't get kind of so screwed by the, by the, the, you know, by the game on that particular turn. And I'll explain the, how that works, but there's kind of a, a sequence or a flow to this game. One thing you need to make sure that you do going into the beginning of each uh, game turn is that you have enough food to take the actions you want to take for that turn and that you're going to have enough energy in your supply to power your mules. Because, um, you know, as I've been explaining here, food is used for um, actions and energy is used to power your mules. So if you somehow short yourself on food, then you're not going to be able to take many actions. And if you short yourself on energy going into a round, then you're um, not going to be able to potentially power all of your mules. That will reduce your production output for that particular turn and, you know, could set you back in the game. So there is definitely some forward planning that you have to do in this game to ensure that you've got the resources you need to do the things you want to do from round to round. Okay? And I apologize. I keep using the terms round and turn kind of interchangeably during this video, but I think in the, in the game they call them turns, so there's either six or seven turns in the game. Okay? All right, so let's go ahead and kind of walk through the game round uh, phase by phase and, um, you know, explain what you do. So in the expansion phase, which is the first phase, that's where each player is just going to grab a land tile for free in, in reverse player order, right? So, um, and, and the player order at the end of each round is, is uh, assessed based solely on cash, so how much money you have on hand. So uh, if a player, for example, has, you know, produced a lot of stuff, but maybe they didn't sell it, right, for a profit, they just held on to it, well, then that's not going to reflect in their money, and so they might be a little bit lower ranked. Um, and then when we do the, the expansion phase, and each player grabs a tile from the planet, we're going to go, you know, bottom to top. So now that you can, you know, if you've ever played Power Grid, there's sometimes, you know, a strategy where you want to lag behind the leaders a little bit, right, so you can get, you know, easier access to resources and so on in Power Grid. And um, there's a little bit of that in Mule as well. Players can kind of purposefully choose not to sell all of their stuff every turn and therefore maybe not have the most cash and, you know, be a little bit lower in the, uh, in the player order going into the next turn. So anyway, so that's what happens with expansion. Uh, you just grab a tile. You don't get to look at the backside, right? You don't get to peek at the Christite. <laughs> you just grab the tile and stick it on your board in, in the appropriate colored zone. In the development phase, players are going to take actions. And the, basically, you know, it shows you how much food you have to spend, one or two food, each time you take an action. 
Now, during the development phase, there can be up to three rounds of development. One, two, three. You see that depicted here on the player board. I'll show that to you a little closer up. So you see there's like two food spots here in three different rounds. So the way that the, the structure of the, the phase goes is um, norm, normally we'll go, the development phase will be top to bottom unless there's, you know, six or less mules in the store, and then we'll go bottom to top. Uh, the reason for that is if there's very few mules in the store, um, then it's possible not everyone's going to be able to buy a mule because the store might get bought out. So the game makes sure that the players who are in last place have a you know first chance to buy mules, and the players supposedly in the lead um, have to wait their turn. But normally the development phase will happen you know first player to last player, and when it's your turn to do development, you can uh, spend up to two food to do actions. So obviously you can do two one act uh, two one food actions or one two food action right in each round of development. Now, um, the actions are as follows. There's actions at the top here. Let me see if I can get this to focus in. There we go. Come on, focus, focus, focus. Ugh. Okay. Um, you can buy or refit a mule in the white zone for one food, or buy or refit a mule in the red or blue zone for two food, or you can simply refit two existing mules on two adjacent lands for two food. So what does that mean to buy or refit a mule? Well, once you've got a land, right, and in the first round of the game, each player is going to grab two lands from the planet. Thereafter, each, you know, each round thereafter, you just get one land. Um, so let's say, for example, like down in here, this player has already got two uh, land tiles from the first, you know, um, expansion phase. They grabbed one of these special river tiles. And there's always one river per player on the planet at the start of the game. River is kind of a special tile. It can only go here um, along the river spots. And it can produce, it's really good at producing food and pretty good at producing energy. But that's it. No Christite, no Smith ore. Uh, but let's say he grabbed a river plot and he grabbed one of these plains, um, you know, tiles. <clears throat> now when it's his turn to do development, if he wants to, you know, produce anything on those land tiles, he's going to have to buy a mule and put it on each tile. Now the price of mules is based on the price of Smith ore in the store. Um, so again, as you can imagine, supply and demand, right? If there's a, a, a low supply of smith ore, that would then be driving up the price for smith ore, which would also drive up the price of mules or the cost of mules. That would incentivize players then to maybe go into the smith ore production business because they can make more of a profit from smith ore because the store wants to buy more, right? But, but at the start of the game, there's four smith ore in the store and there's 12 mules. Uh, there's two price charts. The one over here... Um, let me probably point to it this way. The one over here is the price that players have to pay when they're buying things from the store. Uh, the price over here is what the store is willing to pay you when you're selling to the store. So obviously these are the higher prices because the players have to pay the higher price and the players can sell for, for less. Okay, The store drives a hard bargain. Now, at the start of the game, mules cost five. You can see the five next to the smith ore there. So if I want to buy a mule and put it on my, my river tile, that would cost me one food, right? Because it's a, I'm doing it on, the, on a white space. So I put a food over there, and then I would buy a mule. So I take it from a mule pen here. I put the mule on my tile. Now, the store always replenishes mules whenever possible from the smith ore. So because there's smith ore, uh, the store would replenish it like so. So you just take a smith ore, you flip it over, and you put it in the store, okay, or in the mule pens. Now, I've put a mule on my river tile. I can either then have that tile produce food or energy, because that's all that you can do on a river. So let's say I want it to produce food. So I just I put the food on the top, the top side of the tile, and there you go. And I have to pay the five dollars, right? So here's my five bucks. Whoops, ah, I'm gonna pay that over there. Now, I've spent one action. Um, I still could do another action that cost one food, right? But um, I don't have to. I've already done one action this round. I could simply Say I'm done for the round and you know, wait till the next round of development. Because um, like if I wanted to buy a mule and put it there, because this is in a blue zone, right? Um, it would cost me two food to do up to buy a mule and put it on the blue zone. Now refitting a mule simply means you know once I've got mules out on my lands, I might then want to have those lands produce something else, right? So refitting a mule is simply um, paying the food to do the action and then taking the tile 
and rotating it so that it now produces what you want to produce. So for example, you know, in a later round, I could, or later turn, I could spend one food and refit that mule to produce energy, okay? Now, the other interesting thing to note is when you go to actually produce in the production phase, um, mules that are producing energy do not cost any energy. So you, everyone produces energy for free. Everything else, food, smith ore, and christite, cost one energy per mule um, to make that mule active for that turn. So that's how production works. Very simple. Okay. So in any case, um, the other actions you can do are, uh, if I can get it to focus again. Hello. Focus. Thank you. Um, you can move a mule to any other land for two food. Um, you can assay any two lands. So we talked about that. That's how you get to look at the backside of the land tiles and see if there's any Christite there. You can look at your own land. You can look at land on the planet or even other players' land. But for the most part, you're looking, you know, like at the unclaimed un, um, tiles to see where there might be Christite. And you can also look here, you know, to see if tiles you previously took uh, can produce Christite. So that's assaying. Um, next, we have Hunt the Wumpus. Uh, you gain $10 if successful. That costs one food. And then you can gamble at the pub and earn $5, but um, end your phase. That also costs one food. So both of those actions are about just trying to get a little more cash during your turn. Maybe you know, spending some excess food that you might have to try and get a little more cash. Hunting the Wampus um, in the computer game, it was just a way, again, if you had extra time on your turn, you'd run around the, the screen trying to find the Wampus who you always you know, kind of hit out in the mountains. If you happen to run over them, you get some money. Um, in this game, because obviously there's no computer screen, uh, they have this deck of cards um, that on the flip side of the cards up in the corner, there's a symbol. You're either going to find this little furry brown guy in a cave. That's the wampus. So, you know, you, if you spend your food to hunt the wampus, you turn over the top card. If you find the wampus, you get $10. Um, sometimes when you flip over the top card, you see a cave with a red line through it. That means you did not find the wampus. So even though you spent your food, you don't get the money. Um, so that's how hunting the wampus works. And then, of course, gaining $5 from the pub, you just take $5 from the bank and immediately end your development phase. So that's how the development phase works. We're going to go, you know, round by round, each player taking their turn to do the actions they want to do. It's mostly about managing your, your development capabilities on your land tiles, trying to react to the market conditions. Okay, then we go into the usage and spoilage phase. Uh, this is where, you know, any food you spent to do actions will be um, discarded. And then... Um, also, any energy that you spend to power your mules is, of course, also discarded. And then spoilage simply means if players um, have been you know, holding on to um, the goods that they've been producing and not, you know, not selling them, then if you hold on to too much, it'll start to spoil. Uh, you can only hold on to up to 12 smith or 12 christite. Um, every other food spoils each turn, and every fourth energy spoils. So it's just something to keep in mind. You know, if you're trying to manipulate the prices in the market by, you know, holding on to your supply and not selling it to the store uh, or to other players, then, you know, um, that can be good, you know, for helping to manipulate the prices, but it also, you might lose some of that to, to spoilage. <clears throat> Finally, we go into the production phase. Now, at the start of the production phase, we're going to draw a production event card. That is this deck here. So there's like 20 cards, and you're going to build a deck at the start of the game um, with you know one card per game turn, so either um, six or seven of these production events. Now you're not going to know, you know, players won't know which events actually make it into the deck, so there's obviously uh, some um, uncertainty there. And then the very last production event on the last turn of the game is always this: the ship is back card, which um, basically means you know nothing good or bad happens to the players. It's just kind of a reminder that in the last round of the game after production and after we set the prices in the market, then everybody just sells everything they've produced, everything they have in their stock, converts it into cash so that we can see who ends the game with the most money. Now the other, in the meantime, for the, you know, the other um, turns of the game, you're going to run into all kinds of different events, which can affect um, how much players produce for, on that particular turn. And it can also affect ultimately, you know, the stock in the store and therefore the prices of the goods. So things like acid rainstorm, which um, you know adds two to every food production land and and subtracts two from every energy production land. So obviously that's going to drive up the supply of food and drive down the supply of energy. <clears throat> you know there's things like uh, radiation, where 
Um, if it happens on turn one, everybody has to turn off one of their mules because it kind of went berserk. If it happens around two um, or later, I'm uh, sorry, turn two or later, then one of the players is going to end up losing a mule because the mule went berserk and ran off into the wilderness. Um, things like, oops, let me find some other cards here. Um, oh, we've got the pirate ship. Where is that? Pirate, pirate ship. Uh, pirate ship is kind of a controversial one um, because the pirates come and steal all the crystite from the planet in terms of what's been produced uh, previously plus what gets produced on that round. That is the card or cards, if you will, that kind of balance out the crystite strategy. Uh, because crystite, again, being push your luck, high risk. Um, if players you know, exclusively focus on producing crystite, obviously that means there's going to be a shortage of the other goods, right? But because crystite has an unpredictable price, you, know, you have to hold on to it for sometimes for a while to make sure you sell it for the maximum profit. But then there needs to be some sort of risk there. Like the longer you hold on to crystite, the, you know, maybe the more chance that you have to lose it. That's what the pirate ships are all about. Um, because they can come in, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a round, if it happens to be the card that's flipped up, and steal everybody's crystite. So, you know, you want to, if you're going to go with crystite, you got, you know, there's some, some tension and some risk there, depending on how long you hold on to it. And there's other things like fire in the store, sunspot activity, etc., um, you need these cards in order to, you know, provide some variety from play to play and also provide some unpredictability in the market conditions. So players have to be able to kind of respond to the, you know, a relative supply and demand of the goods in the game. After you resolve the card, then um, each player you know, simultaneously will determine how much um, they've produced for that turn and they'll gain, gain you know, their, their resources from the, uh, from the supply. The way you determine how much you produce is, you know, let's say I had a mule... On, on my river plot and a mule on my, my plains plot, and I wanted them both to produce energy, as you can see there. Um, then each tile, assuming the, the card does not affect energy production, um, each tile will produce what it shows. So this will produce two, that'll produce three. That's a total of five. But there's something called, uh, it's like the synergy bonus, or exa I can't remember exactly what they call it. But if you have plots of land uh, directly next to each other that are producing the same thing, then the space in between will also produce one of that resource. Um, so there's, again, some strategy in, in terms of where you place your lands and what you want them to produce so that you can use the synergy bonus to produce extra. So in this case, I would produce two plus three is five energy plus one uh, synergy would make six energy. Um, so I would gain six energy from the, from the store. I'd put it here in my supply and, um, you know, that would be my production for the round. Now, if I had produced, you know, food here instead. I would get three food and three energy, but obviously no synergy bonus. Okay, so everybody does their production at the same time. Then we move on to pricing. Pricing is where we're going to adjust the prices in the store. That's going to be based, again, on supply and demand. So here's how it works. And it's printed right on the board. Uh, for Smith Thor, the price will go up one slot for each empty mule pen. And a mule pen can hold two mules. So if we're completely out of Smith Thor and we're also running short on mules, that'll drive the price up. Um, obviously if we have, you know, plenty of mules and we have leftover smith ore, that'll drive the price down. Uh, Christite will be, uh, the price of Christite will be dictated based on the, um, uh, production event card that you draw. So if this happened to be the production event card, you look down in the corner and it would say Christite is a price of eight. Okay. So you just set, set it randomly based on the card. Food, um, for each player, that is, it has less than four food in their stock at the end of production. For each food that they're less than four, that drives the price up, okay? So, like, if this is the way the food ended at the end of production, I'm, I'm one short of four. So that would drive the price up one slot. But the price goes down one slot for every food in the store. So as long as there's plenty of a supply in the store, that keeps the prices low. Energy, very similar. Uh, for each energy that each player is short in terms of the number of their mules that'll drive the price up. So for example, if I had, you know, for some reason, if I had two mules and no energy in my supply, I would be short, uh, you know, two energy that would drive the price up, you know, uh, two slots. But of course, again, energy in the store will drive the price down. Then we go to the market phase. Um, this is where um, we use this little market tracker here and um, players can buy and sell first smith ore, then christite, then food, then energy. And when you're buying or selling, you can either only buy or sell each type of good. All right. So as soon as you either do a buy or sell transaction, then you just indicate with your little token here whether you're a buyer or a seller. Okay. 
for that for that good for that round. Now, um, again, you can sell to the store. You can sell to other players. You can buy from other players, and of course, you can buy from the store. All depending on the supply and you know what players are willing to do. So there's negotiation and and so on involved. But it's all just about cash. You know, you can't like offer to do things on a future turn if they give you stuff. It's all got to be a, you know cash transactions. Um, also. If players make deals between each other, they're not limited to the price of the good, you know, in the store. Um, you know, if if there's a real shortage of energy um, and somebody has excess energy, um, you know, they might charge me 50 bucks for one energy. And I may have to pay that because maybe I really want that energy, right? So you have to kind of, you know, decide what it's worth to you. Okay, so after we do, you know, all four types of goods of trading, you know, buying and selling, we go all the way through the market phase. Then we go on to the um, ranking phase where we'll rank the players, you know, most cash to least cash. And then we'll do personal events. That's the last phase of the game. Uh, there's two types or two decks of personal event cards. There's lucky events and unlucky events. Um, in the, and in the base rules, there's plenty of variants for how to use these cards. And you can even leave them out completely. But um, what they're intended for is they're kind of a catch-up mechanism. Um, also, they provides for some player interaction, which is kind of fun. Um, and they're usually very low dollar value kind of things, you know, either gain five or ten dollars or lose five or ten dollars kind of a thing. But it provides some extra flavor to the game and um, uh, provides for some player interaction. But in the base rules, the way it works is whichever is the top ranked player at the time, they take one of these, they draw the top lucky event card, they read it to themselves and they give it to one of the other players. So one of the other players ranked two through four is going to get a lucky event, right? So like in this case, uh, your mule won the colony tap dancing contest. If you have one to four lands, you get five bucks. If you have five or more lands, you'll get 10 bucks. Now, whichever player gets this card, right? Whichever player gets the card that's handed, you know, is, is handed to them. They're then going to draw the top unlucky event, read it and give it to one of the other players. So again, the intent there is uh, because the ranking is done by cash and cash alone, Players should also be looking at like how much stuff players still have in their supply, you know, how, how, you know, what their land situation is and their mule situation, and kind of assess, you know, how players are really doing against each other at that point in the game. And that way, you know, it's not always going to be the last place player that gets the lucky event and the first place player that gets the unlucky event. It usually, if players are smart, it's not going to work out that way. Um, they're going to look at what the effect of the card is and determine best, you know, who to give the card to. Okay. Um, so that's basically that's a round of the game. Then you just go right to the next round and play either six or seven rounds of that. And um, whoever's got the most money at the end wins. So that is Mule the Board Game. Again, uh, designed by Heike Harju and published by Alata Pelit.fi. Uh, I'm Matt the Game Explainer, and as always, thanks for watching.